Welcome to the Scoop Road Order. It is Thursday. We have a delicious episode today. Uh, Michigan's downfall is coming. Ward manual done. Question mark, question mark. We got a lot of stuff that we're going to cover tonight. Um, bombshell stuff that we broke on BuckeyeScoop.com this afternoon. Uh, we're going to get into all of it uh, very quickly. As always, we appreciate you guys. Thank you for your super chats. We set up another uh, crew of Pay It Forward members today. So thank you for all of that. Uh, as always, uh, if you uh, have a question, just put it in a super chat. We'll get right to it. Uh, we're going to get into the Michigan stuff. This is going to be a very, very big time episode. So we're super excited about it. If you enjoy this content, please leave us a like. Click subscribe. Also click that little alert bell. It'll give you an alert. We're going to go a little bit early today. Basketball starts at 8. Uh, we'll probably go into the game for a little bit. But we wanted to get a good solid 90 minutes of work in today. Um, uh, also, shout out where you guys are watching from. Shout out who you guys are watching with. Um, and give me your comments on what do you think is going to happen at Michigan? Because it is about to be absolutely wonderful. Nevada, you broke uh, a pretty in-depth uh, preview of a, of a potential article coming out um, that's going to be pretty damning for the Michigan program. Ward Manuel looks like he is on his final legs. Uh, he's been turned on, and the Board of Trustees and the Regents want blood. I've seen this movie plenty of times. I know how it ends. Uh, but give me a little bit about what you've heard about what is going on up at Michigan. Um, and it's not just football related. This is multiple programs, multiple violations, uh, potential crimes, uh, some really bad stuff. Um, but what have you heard of that? Well, Michigan's a mess and Michigan is an absolute mess. And there's an investigation, uh, that is about to be announced. And it's, as you said, it's detailing massive wrongdoing within the Michigan athletic program. Uh, that all leads back to Ward Manual. Ward Manual, whether you call him the scapegoat, the fall guy, uh, the target of score, whatever you want to call him, the Board of Trustees has turned on him. Uh, they're they're going to try to get their you know pound of flesh from somebody. It's going to be Ward Manual. He's got plenty of flesh to give around to. Ha ha, little fat joke there for you. But um, he, uh, you know, he's basically been the athletic director over a program that not only you know, I mean, let's go through these things one at a time. First thing is ob the sign stealing, um, advanced scouting, multi-year on-field cheating scandal by the football program. Yeah, that that certainly that that in, in and of itself is terrible. Um, you know, it, you know, that's gonna they're gonna be uh, you know adjudicated for that by the NCAA. There's an investigation with the FBI, but that that one's bad as it stands. The second thing is alleged sexual misconduct slash rape cover-up situation with the Michigan men's hockey program. But there are allegations that are coming out of that, that there have been some allegations made that have been followed up with as vigorously um, as people would think that they would be. And there's a problem laying there with the men's hockey program. The third is Juwan Howard. And it, it, the fact that Juwan Howard is still working is one of the great mysteries of all time. I mean, this is a guy, I mean, how many incidents in handshake lines have they had you know, where he's choking a guy, punching a guy, doing, I mean, you know, this, and then with the strength coach, an incident with his son where his son's disciplined or talked to by the strength coach, and then Juwan Howard allegedly assaults, goes after, is involved in an altercation with, with him, the uh, strength and conditioning coach is then is ultimately demoted to women's volleyball and some other obscure sports and is ultimately terminated by the program. And then the last thing is some alleged sexual harassment misconduct by the UN men's basketball team. So all of these things in conjunction with each other will be detailed in this report. It's going to be laid out and uh, our belief and our, we've been led to believe this will ultimately be the reason why Ward Manuel has moved on and why Michigan will move on from Ward Manuel. And to me, for Michigan fans, do, do I think they'll be broken up about this? No, I, I think a lot of Michigan fans want them to be gone for Harbaugh being gone. So I don't think from, from them, but this is just another embarrassment, black eye for the program. And to me, the significance is just the fact that the head of the college football playoff committee is going to be moved on. He will not be overseeing the college football playoff committee because he's, he's going to be unemployed. He will not be, the athletic director of of, uh, of Michigan, you know, in, in, in a short period of time. So that's all that was broken today on BuckeyeScoop.com. Very well sourced. 
and um, and, and wait for it because it's, it's coming. Yeah, I, I think that uh, the cover up is like it was shocking as we were going through the stuff. I was like, Jesus. I mean, I mean, like, because some of this is absolutely heinous. The, the hockey team, uh, the, the rape allegations, totally covered up. I mean, nothing, nothing ever came to the light of day on that. Um, but there's a pattern with Michigan. I mean, they did that with Taylor the one, uh, you know, 12 years ago or whatever it was when he was at Michigan. I mean, you guys can Google the Taylor the one rape allegations uh, with the kicker. Um, it was it was very nasty, crude stuff. Um, but again, this is a pattern with Michigan. Um, again, they're complete scumbags. And again, the nuclear wep- the nuclear bomb is coming for this this place, and they're going to clean out Ward Manual. You know, when the when the regents. And the board of trustees, again, I've seen this movie before. I lived it when I was working with trust. You know, when, when the board of trustees turned on Jim Trussell, it was just a matter of time. It's like a, you know, like in a mafia movie where the wrong guy kills the wrong guy. Uh, you know, it's like if you kill like a made guy in the mafia, like your time and your family's time is very much numbered. Or if you guys watch Narcos, you know, you kill the wrong guy. There's going to be a whole p- bunch of people that pay the price and get wiped out. That's what's going to happen with Ward Manual in this athletic department. And again, you know, we've been saying for a month, you know, with Jim Harbaugh leaving and with everyone scurrying out of there that possibly can, every member of the football staff leaving, um, except for seemingly like Sharon Moore and Mike Hart, um, you know, th- these guys know what's coming. And again, th- these guys aren't stupid. And, you know, if we're finding it out, then these guys are probably pretty slick with it right now. But, you know, the basketball stuff is just embarrassing. Um, obviously, the infra- you know, the deal with, uh, Juwan Howard's son uh, verbally accosting the sports information director, uh, and then you know uh, Juwan going after uh, the strength coach, and I mean, it's just been like a complete debacle um, with all the stuff that's been going on up there. So again, I, uh, I I'm excited to see this report. I'm excited for it to see the light of day. We already caught wind of it. We already got uh, the sourcing for it um, on Buckeye Scoop. So as usual, we're ahead of the curve with this one. But yeah, I uh, I think this is going to be it's going to be very tough. Um, and again, we've talked ad nauseum about, you know, the second portal opening after spring ball. I talked to a very good Michigan source right before the show started, and they're worried about that. They're worried about Colson Loveland and some of these guys. Maybe, you know, Will Johnson's dad came out and said, oh, you know, cap, my son's not leaving. Well, you know, I mean, that's fine, but, you know, things change in life. You know, there's, there's people that say, oh, I want to be at one place forever, and this is my dream, this is my home, but – things change. You know, there's, there's a reason why, like, you know, the divorce rates like 65% in this country It's because at one point everyone, everything's lovey dovey. And then eventually it might not be lovey dovey. That's what's going to happen at Michigan. And a lot of these players are going to have decisions to make. And again, it's a business decision. So, you know, it, it was funny, the Michigan source I was talking to, you know, he's like, well, you know, would you want to be Colson Loveland and be the one guy at the 20 year reunion that transferred out? And I'd be like, well, the whole coaching staff did. You know, all these kids that declared early for the draft did. I mean, the only reason Colson Loveland's still there is because he's only a true junior this year. Same with Kenneth Grant. Same with, like, their their best players. They literally couldn't go pro, you know? And I think that they were kind of stuck here. And, you know, I mean, if, if I won a national championship somewhere, I'd want to kick it for a couple months and be the big man on campus and kick it with the girlies and do whatever. But, like, you know, when it all sets in that spring ball's here and, man, this coaching staff just isn't very good. Um you know, and, and then, you know, if you go hit that portal, you might make seven, eight, nine hundred, a million dollars. If you're close to Loveland, you probably make a million dollars to transfer somewhere because he's the best tight end in football. Uh, it'll be a first round pick next year. So why not entertain it? Or do you want to sit through a year that's going to be an absolute debacle? You know, again, I, I, I don't think that the defense, people say the defense will be as good. There's no way. And the offense with an all new offensive line, all new coaching staff, you know, uh, it just, I don't know. I I, just, I can't see it. And again, maybe I, and, I, and maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I, maybe you know, there's been teams that have replaced five starting offensive linemen and a quarterback who's a first round pick, and a, a head coach who's one of the best top five head coaches in college football, and they've gotten better. But I I'll believe it when I see it. Nevada, what's your trajectory for Michigan football? And do you think that the second portal that opens in the spring will be uh, something to watch? Oh, for sure, for sure it is. And you know. I understand the point about do you want to be the guy leaving the but you know to your point everybody else has left everybody who could leave has left you know the seventy percent of the staff the coaching staff has left so uh, you know playing the loyalty card on somebody is, is kind of a, a funny thing because everybody wants to be loyal you know when they when they 
they, but they have to be loyal. But you know, the people that that don't have to be, man, they're out of there. They they declared early, or they headed off to San Diego with Harbaugh. So, um, you know, at at some point, you kind of you look around the room and you realize that you're the rube sitting at the table trying to be the Michigan man. Um, but again, I sincerely don't care. I mean, I'd love to have Colson Loveland. I'd love to have guys. I'd love to see more misery for their program. But look, no matter what happens, they're not going to be great this year. You know, I think their over under is nine and a half. I think that's a clear under bet. And, um, you know, they're not going anywhere. They're not doing anything this year. So but there is a part of me that wants those guys just to wallow in their misery and uh, be on the other side. And I, and it, you know, it wouldn't bother me to have them wander into, uh, into Columbus in late November and just get waxed. Um, that would be, you know, th- that would be very satisfying as well. My, the only thing that's going to be less satisfying is not to be able to see that Jamoke that was like waving at Ohio State goodbye, not having him there and stuff like that. But, you know, other than that, um, you know, it's it's just about a perfect setup for a for a shellacking, and and they're they're going to get one. And and due to the, this report today, their entire athletic department is going to get shellacked. So uh, for Michigan fans, man, um, buckle up, guys. And if people listening and, and being skeptical, hippo about this, I understand. Just go look back on our reporting on the Michigan stuff and kind of go, wait a second, who's been right and who's been wrong in this thing? Um, so. I'm telling you, this one's coming, so wait for it. Yeah, and this is something that, you know, like, when I woke up this morning, I wasn't thinking, what you're, I was kind of thinking, like, what are we going to talk about tonight? And then, like, I get hit with this avalanche of information that's going on with Michigan, and I'm on the phone writing notes, uh, comparing notes with Nevada, and I'm like, dude, like, this is going to be, this is going to be huge. I mean, I mean, the cover-up stuff is bad, man. And I'm telling you, word manual just, uh, it, you know, the, the sign stealing, the stuff with the basketball program, the hockey team. I mean, this is going to be ugly. But again, there's a reason why, you know, uh, the, the douchebag defensive coordinator who went with Harbaugh to L.A. Uh, was like waving because those guys all knew they were gone. Like no matter what, those guys were gone. They weren't coming back to Michigan. So, you know, it's, it's easy to act like a douchebag as a player or a coach when you know that you're not going to see that team ever again. Like, I mean, unless he's, you know, he comes back to college at some point. But he, he, those guys knew their route. So they act like total douchebags after the game. And again, that's fine. They won. You know, and if you don't act like douchebags, then beat them, which, you know, we got to do that this year. But I think, uh, you know, it's going to be real interesting to see how the new coaching staff meshes with some of these players that have really big time options. Like their 2D tackles and their tight end would be coveted in the portal. And again, like, you know, if I'm those kids, like, you know, I mean, if I got to make a business decision, like we just saw – uh, Sab, the guy that was on the field for the last play of the game against Washington, um, take off and go to Bama. You know, I mean, those guys, if they want to go to a program that's going to win, they can go to Georgia, Bama, Texas, Ohio State, um, and not slump. You know, because these guys, I'm telling you, they've got, I think Harbaugh saw what was coming. I mean, these guys play Texas. They got uh, Oregon. They got us. They got SC. I mean, they got the, the, the good teams of the Big Ten. Um, other than, obviously, you know, Oregon. It's, funny, it's so funny saying Oregon and SC are in the Big Ten, but... Um, you know, the, the regular powers I mean, their schedule is brutal this year. So five new over linemen starters, a new quarterback starting new wide receivers. I mean, this is going to be very interesting to watch them on offense. Uh, we got some super chats starting to pour in. Appreciate you guys. Uh, Pooh beard 12. Thank you for the five and thank you for being a scoop ultra member. And thank you for always being awesome on BuckeyeScoop.com's message board. Pooh beard is one of the best guys that we've ever had switch from, this community into the Buckeye Scoop message board community. He's been very active and he's been very entertaining on there. So appreciate you, my man. Uh, shout out to Tora, uh, aka Akeem, and Devin, aka Ohio7715, on nights like this. To the scum fans in the chat, if you can dodge a wrench, you can dodge a sanction. Good luck. Yeah, I think the Michigan people are coming in pretty hardcore. Um, so, yeah. All right, here we go. Um, David Dickerhoof. Thank you for the 20. Louisville Leopards, 1982 Federal League champs. Uh, I played the Federal League when I was at Perry. Uh, nephews were Maslin Tigers. Okay, see, I asked you that last show. Um, I wasn't sure if that was your sons or your nephews, but I remember the name. You know, Dicker Hoof's not a very common name, so I remember that, and that was a, a, a big-time Maslin Tiger football name. I uh, love the show. Best Buckeye show anywhere. Thanks for everything. Thank you for being a great Stark County uh, representative, and appreciate you, my man. 
Um, and I'm glad that you enjoy the show. Again, we crank it every night. So uh, I'm glad that you are enjoying it. And thank you for the Federal League love and congrats on that championship. I won one uh, my sophomore year. So I wanted it in all the uh, like freshman year. I didn't want it my senior year, though, sadly. Deb, what is up, my friend? Deb Sobo, a Scoop Ultra member. Thank you for the five. How is Ward on the playoff committee with this going on? Nevada, uh, do we believe this? he will be removed from the playoff committee? Well, he's not going to be an AD at Michigan anymore. So, yeah. So, um, yeah. yeah, yeah. How did he get the job? You know, people keep asking me that, and I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I, I'm not on, you know, that. But uh, when this comes down, you know, as you said, you know, we've seen this, this, this story before. When the Board of Trustees turns on you, and they've wanted to do it. They've wanted to have a scapegoat for the Harbaugh situation. Because uh, remember, all the stuff coming out about Harbaugh. Harbaugh's going to be extended. Harbaugh's a Michigan man. Harbaugh's going to be here forever. Harbaugh's going to fight. Harbaugh's going to win. Bet. You know, all that stuff. They got to lay that on somebody now because none of it was true. And and Harbaugh left. And he left them high and dry. So who are they going to blame? They're going to blame Ward, Ward Manuel. Ward should have accepted his offer earlier. Ward should have... You know, all the, the, the lies about the Harbaugh contract and all the spinning that's coming from Harbaugh's side, someone's got to pay. And so that's going to be Ward Manuel. So all this other stuff is just, you know, it's just collateral damage. I mean, the, the prize they want, they wanted to take Ward Manuel down. He gave them reason to do this. And this is the reason it's going to do it. And it's, and it's all going to be laid out. It's going to be laid out. It's, it, this is going to feel like, when, remember when you were an Ohio State fan, and when Trestle was getting blasted every day, and it was like Sports Illustrated, Yahoo, uh, the Dispatch, you know, ESPN, just every day it was just like body blow, body blow, body blow. That's what it's going to be like to be a Michigan fan now, because it's it's coming and it's going to be detailed and it's going to be damning. Um, a classic case of lack of institutional control, and, th and then when you throw in the whole sexual assault, side, sexual harassment thing, um, it takes on a whole nother dimension. Um, so this is going to be, you know, just for a program that's already had their reputation decimated, this is just, this is going to be, even, you know, another huge blow to Michigan and uh, couldn't happen a nicer bunch. Yeah, I mean, I, I totally agree. And it's going to be another black eye for the program, black eye for Michigan, the brand football. I mean, having your AD get whacked and then he gets pulled off the committee. But again, you have to remember, some of the dumbest human beings on this earth run college football. Like, I mean, the people that, you know, the, the eggheads that are part of the NCAA, they're just so dumb. Like, they, they passed, like, a ruling today where you can't decorate the hotel rooms anymore. Like, and again, it gets to the point where it's stupid and it's excessive. And that that's, like, the problem with, like, a lot of the stuff that happens is, like, some idiot um, decides that you can't, uh, you, you, you know, some idiot, some, one of these idiot coaches decides that you can't you got to do photo shoots with every single kid that comes to campus so all of a sudden you know these kids all get photo shoots and then some idiot some poor kid has to edit all these photos and crop them and get the lighting right and then they have to send it all on a flash drive to some kid or whatever upload it to so these kids can all have photos in, in uniforms so you know they, they stop that and then some idiot coach uh or uh recruiting guy some some moron decides well, we better decorate their rooms when they come for an official visit. So these kids get like, you know, I'm trying to find a photo of some of these. They get like 600 candy bars and they get like all this, like all this, like, like trash or you can't. So I'm just going to show this little video real quick. Cause I was looking for one. So like, this is like what Texas does. They put stuff all over the bed. They put like a cookie cake. They put like 75 Gatorades and cheeseburger, your Cheez-Its and candy. And, and, and so you know, again, they, they finally, like, they, they said, enough's enough. Like, you don't need to do all this. Because, again, it's a waste of money. Like, no kid's going to eat 700 candy bars and Gatorades and, you know, peanut M&Ms and, like, a, an entire cake. Because you know, these kids eat, like, pigs when they're on these visits. They go to really nice lunch, really nice dinner, snack, late night snack, cheeseburgers, whatever. Um, and, and, like, and we do the same stuff at Ohio State. And I, I, I guarantee you... 85% of the stuff gets thrown in the trash at the end of the visit because, again, they, they literally, like, there's a giant cake with the kid's name on it. Like, what kid who's 18 is going to eat a giant cake? But they put, a, they put a ban on that. But, again, I'm just trying to illuminate the stupidity of the NCAA and the people that make these rules because, like, we have the worst calendar in the history of sports for any sport right now where you've got 
you know, transfer portal. Uh, you've got early signing day. You've got guys on the road recruiting all in December at the same time. Get ready for a playoff game. Then the portal opens when a, a coach leaves or gets fired. Then you got another portal. Then you've got summer official visits now. So, like, the calendar is an absolute massacre on these coaches um, because you have a bunch of eggheads who've never actually coached before or played before or have done anything, like, actually athletic before making these calendars up. Like, oh, this sounds like a good idea. Oh, let's do this. Oh, let's do this. And, I mean, it's just – it's just it's so impossibly bad. Right, so, my rant is over. Uh, Christopher Rowe, thank you for the five. Another fun fact, Joe Montana got hurt that season and Rudy took his roster spot. This is – on the cusp of Nevada, revealing that Gene Smith ran off the field and Rudy Rudinger, or whatever his name is, came running on the field. In Nevada, did you know that fun fact about Joe Montana? I did not. I did not know that, but um, I did know that Gene Smith was the spot that Rudy uh, filled. And um, so, if Gene hadn't done that, everything would be different. It'd be like the butterfly effect. Everything in the whole world would be different if Gene Smith hadn't run off the field on that thing. So, thank you, Gene. For giving us Rudy, Sean Aston, you, you you were great, and the the real Rudy. If you've ever met the real Rudy, he's just like an insufferable bore, and it's like Is people really? in South Bend. Oh, he's ter- He's just like the worst. He's like Buckeye guy. Like imagine Buckeye Is he guy. Really? Like, oh my god. Oh yeah, he's so bad. But but the movie was great. Great movie. Um, terrific story of uh, adversity. Uh, but yeah, the real Rudy is is a douche canoe. Yeah, I mean, but it doesn't surprise me because, like, if you never really played and you played, like, one play in your whole life and they write, they make a movie about it, like, I mean, come on. You know, like, I just, you know, I mean, if you got to, he's probably the guy that, like, wears his Letterman coat still and he's that, he's that dude, wears his rings every day. Like, I mean, I don't even, I mean, I haven't worn my rings in years because it's like, what's the point? Like, that's, that's in the past for me, you know? I wear my Buckeye Scoop championship ring and that's about it. Um... <laughs> Matthew Shelton, thank you for the five. Are there any current NHL players implicated? This we do not know. I do not know any of the names, um, ages, or, or when it if it happened this year, last year. But it's it's definitely in the report. Uh, what years did that occur? I uh, do not know. Look at the Hockey Canada situation. Yeah, I mean that is atrocious. What's going on with Carter Hart and a bunch of the guys that were on uh, Team Canada? Um, look at the hockey. You know, I mean people are going to go to jail for that. Yeah, I mean it's again. I, I do not know the particulars of it. I know that it was covered up by Ward Manual. And again, that's, you know, I mean, and th- this is from a very, very, very high level source. So I, uh, but I don't know the particulars. And again, Michigan has had an incredible run of guys getting drafted high in the draft. I mean, they had like, I think four out of the five picks, like four out of the top five were, were Michigan guys. So um, I, I don't know if any of those guys are implicated. I have no clue. Um, Nevada, do you want to speak to that at all? Because I mean, we don't, we didn't get any particulars on that other than it was, you know, it was a cover up of a pretty severe um, crime. Yeah, no. And look, in, in these situations, it, I'm sure that when the story comes out, it'll be there were allegations and they couldn't justify it. They're looking into it. But the, the, the point is that this stuff's going on there and there seems to be insufficient oversight. There seems to be, you know, that's a, been a big issue and a big issue in college football. That's brought down a lot of college football programs and a lot of, you know, big guys on that is you know, insufficient vetting of the allegation. I mean, heck, Urban Meyer got ran on unsubstantiated allegations from an ex-wife. So, like, you know, how serious is this? I guess we'll wait and see and, and we'll say, it, but it's it, it's coming. And um, I think it's, it's, it's going to be a big deal um again you know in and of itself would be a big deal but when you put it in the whole kind of toxic stew of what's going on right there man the 80s just can't survive in an environment like that and that's that's why you know one of the many reasons he's going to go down yeah i i totally agree um and it's it's bad like, like i said you guys saw the if you guys are hockey fans and saw all the guys take leave of absence and all how to turn themselves in i mean it's it's really bad stuff and again it, but it's a heinous crime so i mean they shouldn't put themselves in that situation Keaton, thank you for the five. Uh, Kirk, what team were you playing where you absolutely knocked the snot out of the defensive end on a crack back? I just saw the video on YouTube today. It's funny. I put that short up a long time ago. I think it's this play. Um, I kind of looked ahead and I saw that you asked that question. So I was able to dig it up while we were sitting here. Um, 
So we're playing Oklahoma State here in the Alamo Bowl. You see his wicked quarterback, Brandon Joe, is at tailback. Um, this was a zero round to Teddy. This was kind of Teddy's. Teddy had a bunch of breakout games, but this was one where, you know, obviously the Michigan game, he ran a punt back that year in 04. Uh, but this is a game where he just went ballistic and really put his name on the map. So this is a, it, it's a, it's a, it's a, an end around. So you hand it off to Teddy. Um, you see Justin fakes a handoff and then he, uh, Teddy comes around from the wide side. And I, I kind of just let this defensive end go. Like I, I engage him and then I kind of sneak up and I smoke this cat. Boom. And this felt amazing because I could feel like his soul leave his body as I hit him. And again, I'd be thrown in prison if I did this in modern college football because I lead, I lead with the crown of my helmet. This is textbook targeting. But back then, there was no targeting. So I, I literally put the crown of my head right into his chin. And like his, you know, it's just like heels go flying up. This is like the hit you dream of when you're a kid. And I just flattened him. And to his credit, he actually got up and I just kind of bounced around and I was talking trash, which was great. Um, but yeah, that was a, that was a play and. It's funny when I did uh, I did an interview with Ted Ginn Jr. and I'm gonna have to dig it up. Uh, this is like when the scoop was first starting up in the, in its inception, and Teddy remembered this play and he actually remembered the the guy's number 44. And I was like, and, and I'll put the the interview up. I have to go find it. He's like, it was 44, and I was like, how did you remember the guy's number? And he's like, he was talking trash to me all week. You know, like, because we had all these stupid functions that you had to go. Because when you go to a bowl game, you know, you play Family Feud versus the other team, and you go to a cookout with the other team, and they don't like you go to the FCA breakfast with the other team. They do all this stuff where you like mingle, and like this guy was like talking trash to Teddy because Teddy was like the superstar on the team, even though he was only a freshman. And early in the game, I guess this guy tagged Teddy on on an end around or on a crossing route or something where he would run into a linebacker, and the guy was talking all this trash, and then. You know, I had no idea about any of this. Like, I didn't know this guy talked trash to Teddy. This wasn't like I was being some sort of a, you know, a, a mercenary or a regulator. But I mean, when I smoked this guy, Teddy like loved it, and I had no idea why. And then he told me about it in this interview, and I had forgotten about that. So it was actually pretty cool because like I love little Teddy. Um, but yeah, that was a uh, that was one of my favorite plays. And after that play, um, we used to have a thing where on Friday nights, Jim Bowman, who was our offensive line coach, who also happened to be the offensive coordinator. We'd, t we'd take a test on every single play that we could call versus different looks and stunts and blitzes and stuff. And it, the, one of the questions, the very last question would be, what are your favorite plays that you like that, that you like to run um, just in terms of like proficiency? And my first play for the rest of my career was, was Z around right or X around right or whatever, something around right. Because like I just, I loved being able to get that, that kill shot um, and I never got another one because I mean, you never know when you're gonna get the kill shot, but I had it in that game. Um, but I always like power right to have a front side double team and I could kill somebody. Um, you know, just anything where I could have a double team and, and just like maul some dude. But the 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 zero round with Teddy was that was my favorite play. Um, Nevada, do you remember? I mean, that Alamo Bowl was it was a it was a fun game, it was kind of an embarrassing game because we, we played before like New Year's Eve, so it was kind of embarrassing back then. Um, do you remember that game at all? Oh yeah, no, I remember that the game. I mean, that was we were kind of in the crosshairs right then, and everybody was doubting. And uh, the, the fact that we just came out and laid a whooping on them was beautiful. I mean, just on the scoreboard, physically, every which way possible. And and yeah, you would have absolutely been ejected. That that's that's classic. That is the hit that they're trying to outlaw from football right there with the, uh, the crown. Do you even launch a little bit as much as you can launch it at six, five and 330 pounds or whatever you are. Um, you launched about two inches off the ground there and, uh, and got the guy good. So um, yeah, that, that, I'm sure that guy remembers that one. It was a, uh, it felt, it felt amazing. His soul left his body. <laughs> oh, here, here, here we go. We better get a dog son poppy on the show. David Fennel next for the five dogs and poppy led me astray on that Volk fight. Should have went with my gut. Did you see the NCAA ever using similar punishment to SMU back in the day? Um, I, I can, I mean, I can always see a death penalty. I don't know what would achieve it at this point because you're, you can't, I mean, you can pay kids legally now. So that was kind of what they got zonked for. Um, Nevada Poppy had a nice night though. I mean, overall you guys were up big units, correct? Oh yeah. I mean, we killed, I mean, not, just even on the posted stuff, we were up, but on the unposted stuff, like I said, we hit nine out of 10. Um, and yeah, we, we, we killed it. Yeah. Volk, Volk was a tough fight, but that happens sometimes, man. 
uh, Taporio's got hands of stone and he, and he caught him. So yeah, um, that, that would have, that would have literally been a perfect night for us. Literally a 10, 10 leg parlay, 40 to one. We'd have hit if, uh, if we hit that last one, but we hit everything else. So that was, that was a good night all the way around as for the death penalty. Yeah. I mean, but you think about back then the worst, you know, I mean, I think the worst thing people could contemplate was paying players and kind of corrupting the whole amateur system. And so now that with NIL, really, what's what's worse? The only thing would be on-field cheating. The only the, and the only thing worse than what yeah. Michigan did would po- possibly be would be like outwardly bribing the officials, like like bribing the officials to do something like that. That would be the only thing that could possibly be worse. But I mean, Michigan's thing. Is, I mean, it's uh, I mean, it's death penalty worthy, but they won't get the death penalty. But they'll they'll get a terrible modern day punishment. Um, you know, to fit the crime. And, and I think that's appropriate and, and, and it's coming. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you. Um, Sean Rollins, I did not know you're from Worcester. Were you a Worcester general by chance? Uh, appreciate you being on here every night. Thanks for being a Scoop Ultra member. Thank you for the 10. Kirk, I hope your kids are okay. They need to get tougher. And thanks for keeping the show going. Shout out to Kim. God bless. Yeah, I mean, for those of you guys, if any of you guys missed yesterday, my six-year-old broke his arm after a week after my two-year-old broke his leg. So, you know, it's like I tell my wife literally every single day when I see her first thing in the morning, they don't make them like they used to because your boy has never broken a bone before. Even though I played in the National Football League and played at Ohio State, somehow I must have drank enough milk and enough cheese that my bones are made out of antimantium like Wolverine. Uh, so I'll pat myself on the back there. ZZM, thank you for being a Scoop Ultra member. Thank you for the five. Menace says Lane Kiffin is upset at day. Tell me one to 10. How much do you guys care that he's upset? Is there a zero? I mean, Lane, you know, I, I don't know if, I mean, you know, I, and, and again, I talked to Zach. Zach is a, a good friend of mine. Um, you know, he, him and Chris believe that Corey Dennis is going to Ole Miss uh, to be a QB analyst. And again, if I have an offensive coach and I can go work for Lane for a year or two, I, I do that in a heartbeat. And again, I think Kyle Whittingham is one of the finest coaches in the country, but he's a defensive guy. If I go learn from Lane Kiffin, who I think is one of the greatest minds in the country in terms of offense, I do it. Um, but it'll be really interesting, you know. And again, Zach, Zach, and Chris believe that that Corey is going to Ole Miss. He is not going to Utah. Uh, so I and I believe you know they they have got a very good source of that. Obviously, um, Nevada. Uh, Meta says Lane is upset at day. Uh, on one to ten, do you care that Lane is upset? No, I, I couldn't. I couldn't care less. But let me just say, Lane Kiffin is one of the all-time great guys. I'm just—he is the funnest guy to hang around with. Great stories. Um, you know, very self-aware. So it's great self-effacing humor and kind of laughs at a lot of the stuff that he did in his past. And just a guy's guy. So if you ever had a chance to hang out with Lane Kiffin, I'm just telling you. He is a, uh, a party in a box and so much fun to be around. Um, so I, he's a guilty pleasure of mine. I love Lane Kiffin, but do I care that, that, that he's mad at Ryan or Ryan's mad at him or couldn't, couldn't care less. And uh, we play him. I, be, I hope we beat him a hundred to nothing, but he is yeah, a great and, guy. Yeah. And if Zach broke that, you know, cause I mean, Zach's the guy that broke the, the Corey Dennis thing. I mean, I think for Corey, it's a great move because you know, you never know. I mean, Charlie Weiss Jr. is the offensive coordinator. He's probably going to be in, in the mix for head coaching jobs pretty quick here just because their offense has been proficient, and that's just kind of how it works. Um, but, you know, if I'm if I'm Corey, man, I'm I'm hanging around there and, and learning because if Charlie Weiss Jr. gets a job, you either take Corey or Corey could slide right into that spot as a quarterback's coach. So, um, again, happy for Corey and Nikki Meyer. Um, but the one interesting dynamic is that Urban Meyer and Lane Kiffin hate each other. So, you know, Corey getting this job has nothing to do with Urban making a phone call like like he did with Ryan Day, like he did with Steve Adazio at Colorado State where, he, where Corey was there for, you know, a week uh, and then he came back to Ohio State or like he did with Kyle Whittingham where he called him and got him an analyst job. This is pure Corey, um, which, again, I think is, it's interesting. Um, but, again, I if I'm an offensive coach, man, I want to be around a really, really sharp offensive mind. And Lane Kiffin is that. Now, he's not, not for everybody. I like him. I think he – I mean – the funniest thing about Lane Kiffin is he was my coach at the Senior Bowl, you know, and it was, it was the weirdest week in the history of the Senior Bowl because Al Davis like publicly was trying to 
uh, get out of Lane Kiffin. Like, you just try to fire him without paying him. So, you know, it, like Lane Kiffin was the head coach of the Oakland Raiders. You know, he was like 31 years old or whatever. It was some crazy young age. And he didn't wear any Oakland Raiders stuff the entire week. You know, and every other coach there was wearing like Raiders sweatshirts, Raiders hoodies, Raiders pullovers. When, you know, you know how football coaches dress. Um, and then the other side, I think, was the 49ers. Or, or I forget who it was, but like they, they were in full regalia. Like all, you know, when, when there's scouts at the senior bowl or they're at campus, they're in full, they're, if they're a Brown scout, they're in Brown's sweatpants and Brown's tank top or Brown's pullover or whatever. But Lane didn't wear anything. So that was kind of weird, but I liked him, you know, and he was young. Um, obviously he got fired like in season that year. Um, I remember Al Davis looked like the, the crypt keeper at the press conference and he's going in on Lane and talking about how great Jarcus Russell was and, Lane Kiffin wanted to draft Calvin Johnson and thought Jamarcus Russell was fat and sucked, and he was right. Uh, but but Al Davis forced Jamarcus on him and you know basically got him fired. So, but again, I think uh, for Corey, it's it's a great move. Um, Deb Sobel, thank you for the Scoop Ultra membership. Thank you for the five. Thank you for another uh, super chat tonight on Facebook. Guys asked about the cheaters up north, and three people asked him why he wasn't listening to the scoop. Well, why is he not listening to the scoop? I mean, again, like, you know, there's the Michigan beat, which again is the du- it's Michigan beat is the dumbest beat in the history of beats. They are so dumb. They're so inaccurate. And I don't even know who their sources are. I don't think they have any sources. Their sources might just be Ward Manual. It's kind of like, you know, when there's certain beats where their only sources are the sports information director and like the, the general manager inside the program, like they're not ever going to have any set, like real insight into anything because they're going to get the most vanilla filtered version of everything. And that's not what we do. Like we want to know what's actually going on. Not what they, there's what the program wants you to know. And then there's what is actually happening. And that's what we want to know this is the thing over here. Not that, um, Nevada, uh, Facebook guy asks about the cheaters up North and everyone says, why aren't you listening to the scoop? Um, why would anybody not be listening to us at this point? We've nailed everything. Oh, well, well, look, we, what we try to do, we, you know, when Kirk and I set out to do the show, we're like, man, what do we had a show like a night? It's almost like a nightly recap show on everything that's kind of gone on in the world of sports, specifically relating to Ohio state football. And that's kind of what we, we try to do. We try to summarize everything. We try to go out there and vet things, vet new stories, get the thing. And, stuff. and look, we don't want to, you know, we don't want to kill Ohio states. So we're not considering kill kids or kill, you know, do bad stuff, but you know, if you want to come splite where you get everything kind of condensed into one spot nightly, hey, hopefully we're doing it. People are responding. People are coming and doing it. And yeah, if you're a Michigan fan, you better come here because you're not going to get the information over there. So uh, we welcome our Michigan fans, and uh, you guys can listen to and you can get the you can get the scoop as well. God bless, man. I mean, they they've been just impossibly, impossibly bad. I mean, like like recapping some of the takes, like oh. Jim Harbaugh's on a private jet back to Ann Arbor to sign the contract. Oh, he's actually in Los Angeles. Oh, oh, he actually just became the head coach of the Chargers. And it's like, you know, Nevada, Nevada Buck, aka Tinker Buck, aka Big Strawberry Oreo Milkshake guy, it said, bet all your money on Harbaugh to LA in in like it was like early December. I mean, it was like it was, it was it like was, impossible. It was, early. It, was, it, was, it was plus three fifty. You could get plus yeah. three fifty on that bet. I said, put it all in, guys. It's done. It's done. <laughs> it's like, it's, and then guess what? He goes, and then he's at the best thing ever is when he's at that he's at that thing at the arena, and Ward Manuel's like, I'm working to extend this man, and then Harbaugh's like, yeah, and then like like a week later, LA Chargers new head coach. He's got his little stupid khakis on. He's bringing us who got it better than us shtick. And I'm like, oh, my God, what a clown car. Uh, the Summit Band, thank you for the 20. Um, are you a real band? That'd be interesting. I'd love to see if we've got a band watching the show. Uh, put that in the chat. I'd love to support you guys however I can. Uh, Adam Dare, thank you for the five. You guys work really well together. We fight like cats and dogs constantly, believe it or not. I mean, because Nevada <laughs> knows that I want Michigan to be great. And he does not want uh, Michigan yeah. to be great. So we fight no. all day, every day. How did you meet and how did this podcast come to life? P.S. It's dare like truth or dare. Okay, so I said Dare like it was uh, Yinka Dare, the guy that played for the NBA in the mid-90s. So I apologize for that. Nevada, how did how did we meet? I remember how we met. 
And how did this podcast come to life? Do you want to start this one or do you want me to start it? Because I, I get long winded nah, sometimes. No, nah, you do get long winded. I just remember Kirk and I have common interests. We both like, we both like to gamble. We both like, you know, going out and have a good time. We both love Ohio State football, and we found a lot of common ground talking about stuff, despite our, uh, despite the fact that I'm old enough to be his dad. Um, we uh, found a common ground on this stuff, and the podcast is just. You know, like I said, it's, it was a thing that we always wanted to do. We wanted to podcast more, um, and we we really, like I said, we we're trying to come up with a concept, trying to figure out, you know, when do you want to go? Do you want to go first thing in the morning? Do you want to go in the midday? Do you want to go in the afternoon? And we're like, no, let's do a nightly show. Let's do a nightly show where we can kind of summarize the day's happenings and uh, just kind of take it off from there. And, um, you know, all you good people showing up, really, because if you don't show up, there's no show. So, we really thank you guys for for showing up to the show and uh and all the compliments and all the kind words because it's never not appreciated and we uh we really we really are humbled by the uh by the outpouring so thank you guys very much yeah so i mean we met on god scout a long time ago or yeah i think it was scout like when i first got into working outside of football um, I had no idea who Nevada Buck was. My former father-in-law asked me who Nevada Buck was, and I said, "What's a Nevada Buck?" And I, uh, and I, I just kind of went through the whole story, and, and he's like, "He knows everything." I mean, he's like unbelievable. And I was like, "Okay." So like when I when I got out of coaching and I needed to like you know get some clients for what I was doing for work, I joined the message board, and I was Kirk. I wasn't some alias. I wasn't some whatever. And I started talking to people and got to know them. So we we had lunch one day kind of hit it off. Then we went to rivals together. Then we started Buckeye scoop together. Um, now we've kind of taken over the Ohio state media universe. We've got the number one podcast, the number one website, um, kind of lapping the field at this point. But we, uh, you know, I, I just think that we've, we've worked really well together. We're very motivated. Um, we really take this thing seriously. Uh, so I think that that's something that's special is like not everybody you meet in life wants to work as hard as you do. Um, cause we want the show to be good. You know, we, we, we get a lot of comments. We get a lot of feedback. Hey, I had a bad day. I, I couldn't wait to see the podcast. Hey, you guys always make me laugh. You guys always have good content. Um, you know, and, and like I always say, like this show only matters cause you guys make it matter. You know, this is a big show cause you guys make it a big show. And I mean that, like, I'm not kidding when I say that you guys show up and, and you guys like to kick it. You guys have a chat. I mean, we've, we hired, you know, two of our, our, our regulars to be moderators with, with Akeem, AKA treasure, the Torah, and Devin, you know, Ohio 7715. Um, and it's just become like a great community. You know, my wife's on here. She's moderating uh, with our two little broken kids that are, you know, sitting next to her. So it's um, it's fun. Uh, again, we're going to have get-togethers. Uh, a lot of you guys have made the jump and joined BuckeyeScoop.com, which is that's our, our home for the other 23 hours a day. And that's been fantastic to see a lot of you guys jump in on there. So, but it, but it's fun. Again, I just love, um, I love doing it. Uh you know, it's just kind of a natural progression when you're on a website to do a podcast as well. Um, and it's been, it's just been a great, um, a kind of a great harmony between the two because people, you know, they, people on our message board like to watch the podcast and people on the podcast have joined our message board. Um, and it's just made the community just like explode. So it's been awesome. And again, we're, you know, we like to, we like to grind, you know, so we, we get on here, man, and we, we, we work hard and, you know, I was on, I had the phone glued to my ear for about three hours today. And I was like, I got to get out so I can get some oxygen. Cause like, I'm getting all this Michigan stuff and it's just like, good God. But again, that's, that's why we're different because that's how we work. Uh, D sunny. Thank you for the five. Why does there seem to be a universal hate towards Eli Apple? He seems to stay on a roster, but people always try to down him. I don't know. Uh, Eli is kind of a different cat. You know, Eli, you know, he's a talker. He's, he's a talkative kid. And, and I've always had good interactions with Eli. Like I like Eli. Um, but he, he likes, he loves to talk trash, you know, so he talks trash to Tyree kill, talks trash to whoever. Um, and that doesn't always ingratiate him. His mom is very opinionated. Um, a lot of people aren't fans of his mom. I think his mom's fine, but I also don't pay attention to her. Um, Nevada, uh, your thoughts on Eli Apple. Again, that's kind of a, an interesting thing. Um, cause I haven't heard Eli's name in a, in a few years. I know he's been on rosters and kind of bouncing around a little bit, but, uh, your thoughts on Eli Apple. Yeah, well, first of all, D. Sunny goes in the Hall of Fame for uh, for being on uh, Buckeye Scoop and for the first Eli Apple question that we've ever had on this podcast. Yes. But yes. Um, 
No, I no, I think you hit on the head. Eli just says weird stuff. He says weird stuff on social media. His takes are kind of weird. His mom has some weird takes. And I think it, it doesn't necessarily ingratiate itself to either his own fan base or opposing fan bases. So um, I, I think he likes that, though. It's got to be purposeful because he grates on people. And uh, I think that's why people don't like him. But no, I thought he was a terrific player here at Ohio State. And I like Eli. But yeah, I can see how he's not everybody's cup of tea. Yeah. And, and again, like, you know, that's that's fine. Like, he's got his own little quirks. But I mean, he's a first round pick. And, you know, I think that a lot of people in New York don't like him because he was a bust there. Um, you know, he got released and uh, fought with teammates. And But again, I don't care. Like, he won a national championship for us. So he can fight with whoever he wants when you do that kind of stuff. My man, Tony Turley, how are you, brother? Thanks for being an ultra member. Thanks for the 10. Who was it that once said about Lane Kiffin he couldn't organize a fist fight? I believe that was the GOAT, Nick Saban, said that. And I'm sure he said stuff way worse to Lane. Um, if you guys ever want to laugh, you can watch Nick Saban's compilations of him chewing his coaches. Like, chew, you know, he calls it a, a butt chewing, but he uses, you know, obviously the A word. Um, but yeah, he, he laid in Lane pretty good. And again, Lane Kiffin is one of my favorite coaches of all time because in 2014, he stopped giving the ball to Derrick Henry. And we wouldn't have had a chance in the world if he would have kept handing it to Derrick Henry, who was, you know, the freak of nature, Heisman Trophy winner the following year. But he didn't. He got cute, and the Buckeyes came back and won and then ended up winning the national championship. So thank God for that. Uh, Nevada, uh, I believe it was Saban said he couldn't organize a fist fight. Do you believe that about Lane Kiffin? Do I believe he could organize a fist fight? I believe he could organize a fist fight. And you're thankful for him not running Derek Henry. I'm thankful for Layla. Thank you, Lane, for bringing Layla into all of our lives here in Manhattan Beach. It was a little oh. ray of sunshine that you brought to all of us. And um, and for that, we thank you, Lane, forever. Thank you, Lane. Yeah, it's funny because I, I was thinking this is the USC thing. So I was like, I was thinking Raiders, but the Raiders were, were in Oakland when he was there. So, yeah, it wasn't the LA Raiders. USC, I mean, it's weird because he's been coaching for so long. And he's not really that old, you know. I mean, he's just he got a he got an NFL head coaching job when he was like thirty one years old, some crazy number. Um, and you know, obviously he was working for Al Davis, who was insane. Uh, then he bounced. I mean, he's he's lived like ten lives in coaching so far. Mark Bundy, thanks for the deuce. I'm not finding these allegations anywhere. It's because they haven't broke yet. I mean, that's what we're that's what we did today is we broke them. They're on BuckeyeScoop.com, but uh, that's that's what we do. You know, I mean, you didn't hear anything about USC and UCLA expanding into the Big Ten uh, for about a year uh, after we had it. Um, Nevada, your thoughts on that? Again, that's kind of what we do. Well, look, the Juwan Howard stuff is obviously the sign stealing stuff is out there. The Juwan Howard stuff is out there. Some of the other stuff's been, you know, I don't, I don't know if it's been hinted around or whatever, but I'm just, it's coming. I mean, I, you, 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 what you have to ask yourself is, do you think Nevada and Kurt got up this morning? <laughs> you know, Nevada went to went to Coffee Bean. I got like the dark chocolate ice blended with the whipped cream and a cheese jalapeno bagel with, um, you know, extra toasty. And I'm sitting there and I'm like, you know, I'm gonna come up and make up some allegations against Michigan. And uh, what do you think? What do you think, Kirk? And you're like, hey, hockey team, let's go off. Let's, let's go on the hockey team. And I'm like, what? That's genius, Kirk. Let's write it up about the hockey team. And just, no, that's not that's not how we roll. This stuff either comes or it doesn't. It's, I'm telling you, it's coming. It's out there. People inside of Michigan know because they're dealing with it right now. So, uh, yeah, it's just a matter of time. Just wait. Wait for it. But it's coming. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's why we're the scoop. Like, we don't wait for the press release. We don't wait for the, the SID to say, oh, you can go with this now. Because, like, you know, we break news. Like, that's what we do. And that's what this is. And this is... This is going to be a monster, and you guys are going to look back and be like, holy cow. Because, again, this wasn't like some let's throw a dart. This was very specific, and it was – it's not going to be pretty, man. I'm telling you, this all comes out. It's going to be ugly. Buckeye Blitz, thank you for the five. Is it possible we don't have enough room for everyone at a scoop meetup? What do we do then? It's a good problem to have. Uh, also, I want a one-on-one -on -one pass rush against you there. Uh, that is good. I will short set you. Uh, hopefully, you're not fast. <laughs> um, but, uh, but, again – I, I, I do – sometimes that does it does worry me. Like, if I do have a big meetup, like, I worry about a place getting overwhelmed because we have a lot of people want to come to a meetup. Um, we're talking about potentially doing a Thursday night NFL draft party. Um, you know, we'll, we'll get all that kind of – all the particulars kind of ironed out. But I think it'll be 
it'll be killer. I mean, I think a lot of you guys will be excited. Uh, August, we're definitely opening up a Buffalo Wild Wings location in Grove City. Uh, it's being built right now, but we're going to be at the grand opening. Uh, we're probably going to have the whole, the whole crew there, so it'll be wild. Um, we do not have a date for that yet. I don't know if uh, when it'll work, but we're going to work with their people and get that uh, settled. But I think it'll be awesome. I think people have a lot of fun. Uh, we'll kind of do like a little season preview deal, and uh, I think it'll be really good. So I'd love to see you guys come out and support us because, again, uh, if we have a meetup, it would be uh, awesome to meet a lot of you guys in person. Uh, Carl McQuaid, thank you for the five. Am I just being a conspiracy nut to think the sign ceiling started long before 2021? Lots of mid full full Marine teams beat or hung with great OSU teams. Uh, Nevada, OH. I O. I mean, I don't think it's crazy. Now, again, I think that a lot of stuff like this, I think it starts off as something that might have been more innocuous or more, you know, like, like, like I've, I've totally admit, like in 2012, I stole Michigan signs, you know, during the game. I stole their signs, called down what we were getting. I was sitting next to Tom Herman. But what I did was totally legal. I didn't have any video prior to the game. I literally just looked through binoculars and picked the signs because I'm, I've got an MBA. Like, I'm a finance guy. I can, I can read stuff and, and compute stuff pretty quick. Uh, and plus, it wasn't, it wasn't rocket science what they were doing. They had one sign alert. It was Greg Madison, the D coordinator. So it wasn't like I was like, oh my God, who's the live guy? Now teams have gotten way more sophisticated. You know, James Laurinaitis talked about how, you know, they had five signalers at some points and you don't know who's the real one and who are the dummy ones. So that makes it way harder. And then guys hold up signs now and try to block the view of everybody. But back then it wasn't as sophisticated. And I, and I harvested their souls that day and it was great. Because uh, I really felt like it it mattered because I was able to do that. But again, these guys were sending people out, videoing signals, uh, deciphering signals weeks in advance, building little cheat sheets that said, you know, this is the Keenan Bailey. This is the lead signaler. He wears a green shirt 22% of the time and a purple shirt 18% of the time. It's just like there's a totally different level of sophistication. Uh, they're, I'm sure they were tying it to video. They were memorizing the signals. Like, that's a way different ball of wax. Because when you're doing advanced scouting, which is illegal, that's, you know, and, and, and you've got stringers. And you know, eventually, like, it was just a big hairpin scheme by Connor Stallings where he's going to have all these guys make 200 bucks to sit there in the rain for four hours and video signals. Like, it just eventually just doesn't really, you know, uh, fit. But um, it could have gone on long before. But, uh, but again, I think that the way that he emerged under Connor Stallings was, you know, it was – it wasn't totally sophisticated because, you know, when you're dumb enough to be on the sideline of a nationally televised game wearing like sunglasses at night with your little central Michigan hat on, like that's not very smart, especially when it's the Friday before your home opener and you're like, oh, I'll skip the team meal and go watch this central Michigan, Michigan state game right down the road. That's stupid. Um, but yeah, Nevada, do you think that could have gone on long before 2021? Well, look, we have we don't have to guess. We have evidence. <laughs> the 2018, the, the cheat sheet that you have showed on this thing, and you and you can call it up right now. I'm sure you have it there on your little uh, on your little computer. That was in 2018, guys. That was found on the sideline in Columbus in 2018. That was a sheet done in advance, so it wasn't done at the game. But it was this wasn't Burt Carton stealing signals with the binoculars. This was a sheet that they had produced before the game showing who was the live signaler, what the signals meant, what color shirts were. That was 2018 Ohio State Michigan game in Columbus. So yes, this has been going on. This advanced stuff has been going on. Stallions just took it to a different level. He just amped it up. He's just like, hey, we, we, we know we're already doing it, but let's just, what if we do it to this? What if we get all the signals? What if I get all the signals and put it through AI? What if I get all the signals and you know, put it through AI and don't just give you a sheet, but actually decipher it for you in real time so you can see exactly what the plays are? Let, that sheet right there, that was a 2018 sheet that was found on the sideline in Columbus after the 2018 game. So you don't have to guess it was before that. It absolutely was before that. Yeah, and shout out Zach. I mean, obviously Zach had this on his show. Uh, it yeah, was that, on this the is internet. Zach Smith. Absolutely. Yeah, so I mean, he's you know, he had it. And I was like, ooh, boy, that is juicy and delicious. Because again, 
some idiot at Michigan like left this thing behind, like they left it on the bench or left it in the trash can or something. So, you know, our guys found it and turned it in. And this is like you said, this was an 18. Like Keenan was like an intern. He wasn't a tight ends coach because tight ends coaches don't signal. Um, so yeah, it was uh it was really uh really, really interesting. But again, it's you know, this is where they were at, and this is the stuff they were doing. And you know, like like I said, they literally break down the percentages of he's in a green shirt 55% of the time, a blue shirt you know, 40 ish percent of the time yellow. I can't make out the yellow number, but it was like that crazy, you know, what these guys were doing. So, you know, yeah, I mean, they were, uh, they were absolutely cheating well before then. Uh, Judd Muter Spraw, thank you for the deuce. What is the timeline for manual to get canned? Uh, things going to happen in the next, you know, month or two. I mean, it's, it's got to be coming, you know, with, when this thing breaks again, you know, you can say whatever you want about anything. But again, when the board of trustees and the regents, are out for you like your life is very very short again it's like it's like a drug cartel being out for you like a drug cartel if you kill the wrong member of the cartel and they find out it was you like you're you're limited this is kind of how it is I mean, you guys probably watch esmeralda and narcos like that's how that's how it is like when you're an athletic director or a coach when the board turns on you it's just it's just a ticking time bomb uh nevada your thoughts on a timeline for ward manual yeah i hate getting you know guys i, I this one of my things i don't like to get looped into timing because then if it doesn't happen at that time it's like oh nevada you were wrong at the time and it's like i don't know it'll be post this investigative report coming out and once that comes out i think things will progress very very quickly because i think the public sentiment is going to be so great and, and again ward manual is not some beloved character up in michigan right now anyway the, the, the fan base 90 percent of the fan base wants this guy gone anyway so i think for them um, this is going to be a popular move and they'll be just happy to push them off the cliff, but wait, to, the timing's going to be report drops and then they move on manual. So whatever that, that thing is, that's going to be the timing. Yeah, I, I totally agree. Uh, Jerry, Jeremy Moreland. Thanks for being an ultra member. Thank you for the five. Appreciate you, my man. Bo nix gone and a new QB in. How good do you think Oregon will really be? I think Oregon is going to be outstanding and at Alston, that is probably going to be our toughest game on the schedule. Um, I could sign my name to that. You can hold me to that. That'll be tougher than Michigan, in my opinion, just because uh, they have a much better quarterback, and we have to go. We have to go out there, and that's a long six-hour flight. We're probably gonna have to leave on a Thursday, um, walk, do a walkthrough on a Friday, and play Saturday uh, again. That's just what we did against Washington. Uh, it's very common in the NFL for teams playing across the coast. They they knock that flight out. Is that flight is a beast down? I know a lot of you guys are travelers and. You guys might be traveling business people, but you know, you fly from Columbus to, to, um, you know, Eugene, I and mean, that is a, that is a haul that's a long flight. Um, so sometimes to get used to the time zone and the sleeping and all that, it's a three hour time difference. And you know, those of you that go to, you know, to Vegas or California or wherever, where you go from East to West, it's, it's different now. Um, so I think that the guys will probably leave early, but I, I think Dylan Gabriel is a really good quarterback. I think that their scheme is excellent. I think, Dan Lanning is a top 10, 15 ish coach. Hasn't won much, but I, I love his aggression. Obviously, did a great job at Georgia running their defense. Um, and they're getting more really good players up there. And they've got two outstanding wide receivers to go with Dylan Gabriel. So that'll be a challenge. You know, that's going to be one where our boys better be ready to rock and it'll be loud. And they've, they you know, they, they beat us last time we played them, you know, and that was a team that, I don't think was as good as the Oregon team that we're playing this year, in my opinion. So, uh, Nevada, how good do you think Oregon will be this year? Real, really good. Dylan Gabriel's really good, and they got a lot. They they got much better in the transfer portal. They return a bunch. Um, I I think it's going to be our, our stiffest game of the year before the you know the deep run in the playoffs um, by far. I think they're really really good, and at home. They're really, I mean, for them, this is about as big as it gets. It's kind of their introduction to the Big Ten. And then the bullies of the Big Ten, Ohio State, comes into their home stadium. Um, so I, I don't think it gets any bigger than that for Oregon. I know this is the game they'll be pointing to their entire offseason. And um, it's going to be a heck of a battle because they're, they're I, I think Dylan Gabriel, I, I thought Bonix did a great job you know, for them, but Dylan Gabriel's really good. So it's going to be a great game. Yeah, I, I totally agree. And, and the team we're probably going to see again in the championship. I mean, there's a, a good shot at that because they're going to be, they're going to be good. And again, that that coach could have gone to Bama, A and M, like he was wanted by everybody. 
Artie Saunders, thank you for the five. RDS bucks from the scoop here. Love the shirt. Appreciate you, my man. Thank you for the love. Thank you for being a part of BuckeyeScoop.com. Again, that is our home base. That is our uh, that's our home field. So if you guys love this podcast, uh, join BuckeyeScoop.com. Even if you've never been on a message board, uh, it's there's nothing that you'll get in your life that's better for $12.99 than joining our site because it is constant entertainment. And we've got a great crew, great crowd, a great community. I'd love for you guys to get to know a lot of our, uh, our people on there. Uh, Kirk, I like your film breakdown. I appreciate that. Can you do a UCLA run game under Chip and how our guys will do in it? Um, the problem with that, honestly, is it, it does get dinged for copyright when I do it on the show. Otherwise, I do it every night because I was watching some of the Chip Kelly stuff last night that he was doing against Washington State. And oh boy, are you guys going to be excited. He does some misdirection stuff uh, where he sends guys one way and then he flips the ball the other way to the running back. And there's just nobody home on some of these plays. So um, I might just throw something up. Um, maybe on, on Twitter or something and break it down and show it to you guys because it is awesome. Because, again, he just gets guys in space where there's nobody around. Because, again, it's a lot of misdirection. It's a lot of eye candy. It's a lot of stuff that, you know, it messes with the eye discipline of the defensive players. You know, they're used to looking at this or that, you know, a puller or a, an orbit motion, a fly motion, a jet motion, uh, you know, the little cheat motion that got real popular in the NFL this year. He does all that stuff, and then he'll, like, go back the other way. So it's like, you know, people, they get lulled to sleep, like, when they see something, think that the ball is going one way, they don't have it go out the back end. And I was just like, oh, my God, is that good? So I'm excited about it. Um, I want to do more of that. Uh, so we're going to figure out a way to do that for you guys because I know you guys love that stuff. Um, Nevada, how excited are you? And I, I'm going to send you the play I'm talking about, Nevada, because it is awesome. How excited are you about Chip Kelly, Nevada? Uh, super excited. Um, yeah, we wish we could show you more of this stuff. But as Kirk said, literally, there's like copyright rules. We put the stuff on and we put more than a few seconds, then the, it gets banged and the video gets taken down. And it's a big it's a big hassle in terms of doing it. Um, so otherwise, we would do that every night. We'd show stuff, you know, every minute of every day. But no, there's uh, copyright issues with it. But no, I mean, Chip loves to do stuff. I mean, he loves to do a lot of these creative things, too, where they disguise. You know, a lot of times, you know, the, the safeties, the linebackers, everybody's reading the linemen in terms of what the linemen are doing. And he'll pull linemen and have linemen, you know, uh, you know, cross like they're, you know, it, like it's a run. And really they're cross blocking in, in terms of the way they're doing a pass setup and it's a pass to the tight end down the middle. I mean, so he'll do all sorts of interesting things to kind of mess with the defense's mind. Stuff that we haven't done, frankly, at Ohio State. We've made it easy. And uh, Chip's not going to make it easy. He's going to be a, he's going to be a handful. And now – that he's just doing this. I'm telling you, I've talked to so many people at UCLA, and they're like, Nevada, I think he's going to stay at Ohio State for like the next 10 to 15 years. I don't think he's ever going to leave because this is what he wants to do. He wants to call offense, and he doesn't really want to recruit, and he doesn't want to deal with NIL, and he doesn't want to deal with administration, and he doesn't want to deal with fundraising. He doesn't want to deal with any of that other administrative nonsense, but he wants to beat defenses and design wonky ways to beat you with their offense and no better place to do it than at Ohio State. They think he's going to be here for a while. I'm just telling you. Yeah. And, and I, uh, it's funny. I literally just, I texted you the play. I'm talking about Nevada where they go bunch set into the boundary, three guys into the short side of the field and they, they bring it back the other way. And I mean, it is just, it's beautiful. Let's see Trey Henderson do that. Oh, be unbelievable. I'm so excited to see what he can do. Um, but I uh, appreciate you, and I apologize. I can't do more of that, so I'm going to figure out a way to do that. Beach Buck, thank you for the 10. If you could go back in time and see one sporting event in history, Jesse giving it to the Nazis, Miracle on Ice, Rome's uh, Best Gladiators, Prixis for Viveris, another. Nevada, I'll let you start with that. If you could go back and watch one sporting event in history, what would you watch? One sporting event in history, man. Um, I'd probably want to watch, like, the... the uh, the, the Mayan or like death ball thing where they had like the thing where the people would play that ball game and the opposing team got put to death at the end of it or something like that. Cause I think that that's high stakes. You know what I'm saying? Like that as good as, as good as, you know, the miracle on ice is and other stuff, nobody's dying at the end of it, but like um, watching death ball, Aztec death ball, I think that'd be what I want to go back for. I'd probably go back to the 06 championship game. And I could tackle Roy Hall before he tackled Ted Ginn. You know, oh, there you fun. go. Yeah. You know, it's like, hey, don't break our best player's leg, you know, dragging him to the ground and snapping his leg into. 
Um, cause that it's, it's really hard to win when you lose your best player who is like your entire offensive plan for that game. Um, but seriously, that might, that might actually be it. I mean, I went to UFC 100, you know, I can't, I don't know. Like, I, I can't think of a, an event that I'd like just have loved to have been at. I mean, the miracle on ice would have been cool, obviously just because of, um, the stakes, you know I mean? I, I mean, I love, I love Olympic hockey when the NHL is involved, like when they take the NHL of it, it's trash just because your know, team USA is a bunch of guys that are retired or they're in the minors or whatever. But like when the NHL is in the Olympics, I think it's a phenomenal watch. Like when they had the gold medal game and it was Crosby scored the golden goal versus Ryan Miller. Like that was awesome. And like, I watched, I watched like all those games. Like, you know, cause I mean, even like a team like, you know, Sweden was really good with Henrik Lundqvist and, like I, I love Olympic hockey when the NHL is involved, but uh, God, I don't, I, I really don't know. I mean, I, I would have loved to have seen, you know, it, it would have been fun to have been at the OT championship game just because I was a senior in high school. Um, you know, I love Jim Trestle. Uh, you know, that was a game that kind of, you know, it, it kind of reestablished Ohio State football as, as a as a national thing. And we, you know, we were great in the nineties and stuff, but you know, Michigan kind of owned us, and we had great players, but we didn't really have like great, great teams. Cause you know, to be a great team at Ohio state, you have to win the national championship, like period and point blank. Like I was on the 06, I was on the 05 team, the 06 team and the 07 team. 06 and 07, we won the big 10 completely outright, uh, which was a thing before the conference championship. Now you can only win it outright because of the championship. And we don't have reunions. They don't recognize us on the field. And again, and I'm fine with that. Like I like the stakes being high, but most schools, if you won a conference championship, like in 10 years, they bring you out on the field and you know, the 10 year reunion of the 2005 team that beat Brady Quinn and Notre Dame and uh, beat Michigan. And yeah. they won the big, yeah, 10. But Kirk, Kirk, can I make a point though? The 1968 sure. team wins the national championship and they have the reunion thing and they haven't oh, come back God. and Gene and Gene Smith charged them for the tickets. Oh, I know he, ch- he uh, charged I, them for the I tickets. Know. Dude. I, I mean, Rex Kern went ballistic. I know. Trust me. I, I, I heard the whole story. I mean, like, again, how I, crazy I, I mean, I, is how crazy is that? Well, like, I just I get embarrassed for our athletic department and our football program when when I hear stuff like this from the old timers because I'm like, you know, here's the deal: if you're smart, if you have a brain, like, if I ran this athletic department, do you ever think I'd ask Rex Kern to pay for a ticket for a game where we're gonna honor him or like the you know the seventy was it the 70 team? It was whatever team Corny was on, like the 74 team. They honored him for the Maryland game and they made these old guys pay for tickets. And a lot of these guys are on Medicare, Medicaid, whatever. Like, you know, they're just kind of, you know, they're just kind of getting by and then they got to come pay 200 bucks for an Ohio state ticket. So that they, so they can get recognized on the field. Like that's asset. Cause you don't, here's what I would do. Kirk Barton, athletic director, Ohio state university. I would say, Hey, um, Jay shot and scene. Brian Schottenstein, uh, or about, or Keith Wandel, like a thousand other of the big time donors that I'm really good friends with that I know. I'd say, look, Hey, do you want to sponsor the 1974 team or whatever, or the whatever, whatever year it is and, and, and come out of the 68 team. Do you want to sponsor it? And your family can come out on the field and stand next to them. It only costs you 50 grand. And these guys would say, well, that's what I spend on my private jet fuel to fly to Florida and I fly there three times a week or whatever. So yeah, I can write you a check for 50 grand. So then these old guys don't have to pay for the tickets. Everybody can feel good. You probably throw a little social hour for them. Cause you know, like it's just, but we don't think to do that. Cause I mean, a lot of these donors that have a lot of money would say, yeah, man, I, I love corny green. Like corny green's my hero. I'd love to, I'd love to take care of him and his friends. And you know, cause a lot of these guys are getting old. So there's like fewer and fewer of these guys that are able to get back for these games. And some of these guys, they don't get, they don't come back on principle because they get charged. <laughs> They're like, what? You guys made how much money in your TV deal? I mean, we broke every record in the world last year for uh, revenue. And like, they, they charge these old guys. And I'm like, and I wouldn't go back either. Now I don't have to go back because you know where I sit, but it's just like, good God, man. Like a little, a little um, awareness maybe. Cause again, you could make, I could make one call and get all that taken care of. Like I would be happy to write a check love to stand down on the field, you know, it, they, they recognize him for 15 seconds, like during one of the TV timeouts or whatever, between the first quarter and second quarter. So, but again, that's a rant, but Nevada, are you surprised? No, 
not surprised and just happy that we're going in. I know some people don't like that. Some people are like, oh, Nevada, you're a meanie. Gene Smith is the best. It's fine. God bless you, Gene. And uh, I'm on I'm on to bigger and better things with the new AD. So let, let's go, Bucks. Uh, massive upgrade. Uh, Mark Bundy, thanks for the deuce. That's why I love you guys. We hear it here first. Yeah. I mean, again, like we don't, it's like Nevada said, like he said it absolutely perfectly. When he woke up this morning, you know, a lot of days we wake up, we kind of know what we're going to talk about. Today, we had no idea that we're going to be breaking a big Michigan story. Like I had no clue. It's just, you know, call some people or the way we are now, we get calls. So we get calls, talk to people. And then it's just like, oh boy, this is going to, well, I was like, hey, I know what we're going to be talking about tonight. And here we are. And it's, uh, again, like it's, you know, again, we've got a track record and people, you guys can track us where we were with, with, um, with Will Howard, Caleb Downs. I mean, it's just, it's where we're at now. So again, that's why you guys, we appreciate you guys. Um, cause again, we put in the work. This isn't like some, we don't use a Ouija board to come up with this stuff. This is stuff that literally is we, we, we mine for and we get, uh, Donald, Karen, Ross, Bach. Thank you for the five. We are with Nevada. Do not want Michigan to be relevant ever again. Nevada. Oh, I O. Everyone's with you, Nevada. Everybody. We do not want Michigan to be good. I really don't want them yeah, to be well, good anymore. Cause they got, they got to be too good. So it's like, you don't want to be too good. You know, I don't but want I them to be good I, at all. I like beating I an undefeated Michigan team. It feels really good. Yeah. I, I, I don't want them to ever win. <laughs> uh, Poovier 12. Thank you again for the five. Appreciate you, brother. Uh, thanks for being an ultra member. Um, how do you guys feel about us hiring Brandon Jordan as a D line analyst? Could he be the Larry Johnson era parent? The list of NFL players he coaches is insane. Nevada OH. I O. I. Here's the thing. You know, I, I, I get that we, you know, we hired a new analyst and he's a guy, you know, he's at Michigan State for a hot minute and Seahawks or wherever he's been, but like he's a young coach. You know, and again, I'm not trying to pan the guy. Um, cause again, you know, he's, he's, he's worked with a lot of guys. Um, and, and, you know, we've had, um, kind of a bunch of these guys come through the program that have been Larry's, um, they've been Larry's program assistant. This is the kid, Brandon Jordan, but like, he's not at the caliber to replace a guy like Larry Johnson. Like he's a guy, he's a pastor specialist. And again, not denigrating. Him. He's a young guy. Like if that D line job opens and Larry Johnson, it retires in two years after his contract, like you need to go get the best D line coach in the country. You know, and again, I'm not saying this guy can't eventually be that, but this is a young guy. He's never ran a D line room. Um, and, and, and frankly, unless it's an incredible circumstance, like Brian Hartline or James Laurinaitis, I'm not a fan of giving a guy their first job at Ohio state. I think that's insane. I think it's stupid. Um, and, and I think that, you know, if you look at, you know, past hires that we've moved on from, uh, I've been right because, you know, again, if you're teaching your 16 year old daughter, how to drive a car, like you don't want to enter her into an F1 race, you know, you take her into the parking lot of, you know, Walmart or whatever, and you put the cones down and teach her how to park in the parking spot. You don't say, Hey, you know, honey, uh, I'm going to get you in this really fast car against the best drivers in the, in the world, guys that make, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars a year. And you're going to learn how to drive a car in that. Cause that, that's what's like coaching at Ohio state. I mean, there's no margin for error at Ohio state. So could he be elevated? Yes. But do I think that Ryan is exceptionally aware of, of his misfires that he's recently had from elevating from within? Yeah. Cause there's, you know, Keenan Bailey's on watch. I know he got an extension. Um, Corey Dennis, obviously Ryan moved on from, um, you know, Heartline is just a different beast just because he played at Ohio. State. He was an NFL guy, really good technical guy, ex exceptional recruiter. Uh, and, and James Lord is, you know, the best teammate I ever had along with AJ Hawk. And he's an exceptional person, exceptional coach, brilliant mind. You know, those guys are different because they're going to be A-plus recruiters from day one. Um, but again, this guy, he, he could be really good. I don't know. But we've had like three or four of these guys that have come in the program in the last six or seven years under Larry. And a lot of them end up moving on to, to elsewhere. Um, but I, I just think you have to go get like the best guy you can. And, you know, like, I mean, Randall Joyner, the guy at Ole Miss or, or someone like that. And he's the guy that was or Jason Taylor from Miami. Um and go pay for the best, you know, because this is not, it's not a game at Ohio state. It's not, it's not a place where you can learn on the fly. And I, I personally feel bad. Like I love Corey Dennis. I've known him since he's a little intern 
And, you know, for him to be thrown into being the quarterback coach at Ohio State as his first job is almost not fair just because, you know, I mean, he, you got to go learn to coach football at a, lo- at a lower level and make mistakes where you're not under like the searing hot spotlight of Ohio State and Ohio State's fandom uh, where all the stakes are as high as possible. Like sometimes it's good to just go to a lesser place and be able to learn from mistakes and not get massacred uh, when you screw something up. Uh, Nevada, your thoughts. Again, I think that this is a good hire. Don't know the guy. Obviously, he's coached a lot of NFL guys. He's done his little trench life school or whatever it's called. But um, your thoughts on that? No, look, I, I'm excited. I'm glad he's here. Uh, do I think he's the heir apparent? No. Um, as for the training stuff, just a little inside baseball. And I'm not saying this is the case, but as, as you know, Kirk, I own a sports training facility, big time training facility. You know, we've had over 100 Olympic gold medalists come through facilities. So you can get, if you said, hey, Nevada, who's trained at your facility? I could give you a list of 100 Olympic gold medalists. But did I really, you know, it's kind of like listing names on a board, you know, like, did I really develop TJ Watt or did I really develop, you know, Cameron Hayward or whomever? No, but they did work out at my facility. So um, it might not be quite as impressive as it sounds on there, but look, it's great. I'm glad he's here. And um, I hope he's I hope he's terrific, and I hope he helps out Ohio State because we all want to win. And if he can help us win, let's go. Absolutely. Oh, here's a good one. Armed therapy. Thank you for the five. Will Bavada Nuck be incognito at the meetup, or will he wear his logo on his head? Well, we've had meetups in the past, and you know, uh, Mister Nevada has been you know in his trademark attire, uh, just regular old guy. Uh, Nevada, will you have a logo on your head or a horse head over your, your head? No, no. I, I, if I, if I come to the meetup, man, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to be there. I'm going to be, uh, dipping the wings in the truffalo sauce and, uh, eating smash burgers and, and holding court at the, uh, at the bar. That's what I'll be doing. But, uh, no, I will, uh, I will be in, uh, in full scoop regalia and, uh, ready to rock. Vodka tonics on deck uh, <laughs> let's go <laughs> Mike Pilch thank you for the 15 appreciate you my man Oregon doesn't deal with the level of physicality in the pack that they will in the big even schools near the bottom of the big are physical don't you think that wears Oregon out in their first big 10 season well again like we were really good a couple years ago and they came in to our house and smashed us you know Kerry Combs his last year um, you know, the, the CJ Stroud, uh, Rose Bowl year. Um, so, you know, I, I think that, you know, they've had some very physical players. Like, you know, I mean, if you guys watch Panay soul play tackle in the NFL, he's probably the most physical tackle in the league other than Trent Williams. Um, I think that, you know, Dan you know, Lanning is, I mean, he's a physical coach. Like he does, he recruits tough guys. Uh, they're good in the trenches. Uh, they've had, you know, they got a, an offensive line that's going to get drafted high this year, maybe a first rounder, their center. So I think if you if you get the old era of, of, of Kelly and Helfrick out of your head and you get into the kind of this new era of Oregon football, um, I think they're physical. You know, Mateo Uyunglele, I'm sure will be starting at DN for him, a kid that we wanted uh, dearly. Um, you know, they, they've got some physical dudes now. So uh, I think that there are some physical teams in the Big Ten. Like I think, I think Rutgers, I think Michigan, I think us, uh, Wisconsin, but – yeah, you know, Oregon's got a lot of skill too. I and mean, they've got better skill than pretty much everybody in the Big Ten, except for Ohio State, in my opinion. Um, so I, I don't know. I mean, I, I think that, you know, the Big Ten is more physical than the pack, but uh, I think Oregon is a physical outfit. Uh, Nevada, agree, disagree? Uh, your thoughts? Yeah. And no, I think, you know, in the pack, they were one of the more physical outfits. And, um, you know, will it be a, a, a transition coming to the Big Ten? Yeah, you know, for sure a little bit. But as you pointed out, man, they came into Columbus and they handed it to us. And they were missing Thibodeau that day. I think they didn't even have him. You think he was yeah. hurt. And yeah. um and and they laid it on us. So uh no, it's it, they're gonna be a they're just a terrific addition to the Big Ten, and they're gonna be a, a just a worthy opponent that we're gonna see probably two times, maybe three times this year. So uh, get familiar with Oregon because we're going to be seeing a lot of those guys. Yeah, I, I, I mean, they, they didn't have Thibodeau or Justin Flo, who was a really good linebacker that day. And I mean, Thibodeau was, you know, top 10 ish pick. I mean, he's really good pass rusher. Um, and it was a noon game. So I, I was like, well, 
God bless. I mean, everything in the world's breaking for Ohio State. They don't have their best player, Thibodeau. Uh, they don't have their best linebacker. And they got to play a noon game coming from the West Coast, which again, you know, if you're a sharp and you're in Vegas, like something that those guys look at is, you know, if a team's coming west to east and they got to play with a three hour time advantage at one o'clock, that's a thing in, in the gambling world. You know, again, it's, you see a lot of these teams like, San, you know, a bad San Francisco or, or LA Rams team, they come to the East Coast and they play like the Eagles and they get shellacked or they play the Miami Dolphins and they get, you know, shellacked. Um, it, you know, I mean, a 10 a.m. body time start for a football player is is atypical. It's different. So doing it in college where it's a 9 a.m. body time because you're coming from the West Coast to Columbus, um, that's that's the thing. And I'm telling you, and, and Oregon showed up and they weren't scared of anything. And that was, you know, crystal ball. But um, I think that they're kind of on that trajectory. And again, I, I think I got a lot of respect for their program. I think that they do a lot of stuff really well and, and they're formidable. And, you know, Phil Knight is a genius uh coconut dreams uh one two three super chat thank you for the 10 thanks for being an ultra member appreciate your brother extra extra read all about it rudy i don't know where this rudy thing started but it is kind of funny he replaces ward manual as michigan's athletic director manual dismayed him again nevada um where did the rudy thing start because we're getting a lot of this rudy stuff which is kind of hilarious Gene Smith was replaced by Rudy. That's who replaced it. I'm just telling you. Like I oh, said that God. to you. Go check. Go check. The, it was 1975. That, dude, that it. I'm telling you, it all matches up. Go look at it. You can check. What year did Rudy play against Georgia Tech? 75. What year was Gene Smith third Notre Dame? 73 to 77. Who came off the field? Gene Smith. Rudy took his spot. Telling you. I love it. I love it. Uh, Alan Dietrich, thank you for the 555. I love the 555. So I know what it means. Ohio State women's basketball whips Penn State in Happy Valley for the 14th straight win, 82 to 66. OH Nevada. I O. Yeah, the women, the women are balling. And the uh that coach is doing a really good job. Uh Brutus B. Buckeye, thank you for being a scoop ultra member. Thank you for the five. I don't know if this has already been touched on, but we are really recruiting Gus Cordova. Read some questionable things about him. I did too. Um, again, I think you're innocent until proven guilty, but I think there's a long way to go with that. I think that we're in the courting stage. I don't know if it's like totally hardcore with him yet. He's a Texas kid, so long way to go with him. And, and again, I uh, not everything is what it seems. And again, I, I haven't read enough into his allegations. Um, obviously, um, it was heinous what was alleged, so... We'll see. But I mean, that's why you have coaches and you do deep dives on these kids to see what you know about them. Um, but yeah, I think, I think it'll be, you know, it'll be an interesting situation, but I, I don't think that we're close to favorites for getting the kid. Uh, Devin, what's up brother? Ohio seven, seven, one, five. Thanks for being an ultra member. Thanks for holding out that wrench. Uh, thank you for the 50 brother. As always, Michigan sucks. OSU natty 2024 20, and 25. Thanks for Nevada brother Toro. Shout out scoop family. Turn up, family. Best chat in the land. Life chat up. Chat up. Nevada OH. I O. Yeah, Devin is uh, the ringleader for a, a band of brothers going to the Oregon game. Um, I do not think I'll be able to go because I think that you know, our podcasting is so critical, especially in season. So I usually have to hold it, hold down the fort so that we can get um, a good post game show in because. If we don't podcast, I hear about it from you guys. I actually love that. I think it's hilarious. If I take a day off, it is it is a massacre. So I'll probably be holding it down. Uh, but Devin is a great dude, a guy that I talk to every day. And I appreciate you and Tor so much for what you guys bring to this chat. You guys are awesome. Uh, Nevada, anything for our boy Dev? And Oh, and also I see, uh, uh, I see the, the, the raccoon. I see Cujo on your shoulder, which is great. No, nah, we just appreciate, uh, I mean, again, especially moderating on a day like today where I'm sure you got a lot of Michigan trolls you got to exterminate in the uh in the chat so I'm sure that you're busy and uh just keep the wrench handy and uh exterminate all those little uh, those vermin if they get loose in the chat yeah that, that is the best uh the best way to do it uh Ryan Day's beard thank you for being a scoop ultra member thank you for the five I believe the Big Ten championship is signed to Indy through 2024 Ooh, this is juicy, Nevada, with the expansion. Do you see them moving around to Vegas, Arizona, Indy, etc.? Nevada. I mean, 
It's an interesting, I mean, I, I wasn't sure if that was a question or a comment or an observation, but I mean, it's, a, it's an interesting idea. I mean, look, the Vegas is now in the big 10 territory. So um, you could go just about anywhere now because we are coast to coast in all three time zones. Um, every, you know, so could that come to, to Vegas? I wouldn't, I mean, you know, for how well I know the people in Vegas that do this uh. stuff. Uh, they love the Big Ten and they love them some events. So uh, I'll, let me let me dig on that. I can I can probably make a text uh, here I, shortly I, and find out. I know I know, I know who you're gonna be texting too. That's the best part. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, uh, we'll go right to the source. We'll go to the source on this one. Oh, that'll be that'll be amazing if that happens. Yeah, if, if it's at Allegiant, man. Because I that is, I mean, is Vegas not the greatest city in the world to host? like an event. I mean, like what they did with the Super Bowl and like the thing I love about Vegas is like you could stay on the same street and you could spend $10 a night on a room or like $10,000. I mean, literally like anybody, any budget, a million hotels, a million places to eat. It's like, it's the greatest place in the world for an event like that because everybody can go and it doesn't drain you. Uh, but your thoughts on that? Yeah, it just, it's the, it's one of the few cities that can really handle it because it's so concentrated. You can get the, the hotels are there. They've got the infrastructure in place, you know, the dining, uh, the shopping, uh, the, the airport, you know, just everything's perfect there. You know, I've been to so many Super Bowls where you go to the game and you're staying 45 minutes away from the Super Bowl or whatever. It's a gigantic hassle to get to anything in Vegas. It's all there. Like the town is the party. So, uh, the Vegas is the ideal spot to have it. I'm, and it was a, a grand slam home run for the NFL, and I'm sure it'll be back uh, in Vegas soon. Yeah, I mean, honestly, like when, when you say that, like I'm, I'm flashing through my mind, like Dallas, like you and I went to the national championship game together when they played Oregon, and like it was freezing outside, and I stayed at the the Anatole, I think it was the team hotel, and it was like a 40 minute drive after the game. I remember I spent like 250 dollars on an Uber because they had like times eight surge. Uh, I mean, it, it was just a disaster because Jerry rolls in the middle of nowhere because he needed all the land. Uh, and like Vegas is just not like that. I mean, you could literally walk to Mandalay Bay from the stadium or and get, you know, I mean, you, you could basically walk to, and if you have good walking shoes on, you can walk to your hotel, basically to Allegiant, which is, which is amazing. The hardest part about Vegas is like, I just don't think a lot of people make it to the game. You know I mean? I'm sure people would if they bought tickets, but like when you sit in the sports book and it's like electric, like you're like, do I really want to go sit in the stadium right now or, or other establishments? Like, uh, I mean, that's, that's the hardest part for me, man, because I've gone out there for sporting events and did not make it to the sporting events. Um, cause it is a fun city. Uh, Steven Fuentes. Thank you for the five. Uh, <laughs> I just want to hell yeah for the big 10 sweep from the Buckeyes this year. Yeah. I mean, I think it could happen. You know, it's going to be an exciting, uh, an exciting year. Um, Nevada, uh, do you think we get a Big Ten sweep this year with the Bucks? I mean, it's possible. I mean, you know, it's all it's all there. You know, what I'm saying it's it's all there. So why, why not, right? Yeah, I mean, that's exactly where I'm at. Uh, ZZM, thank you for being an ultra member. Appreciate you, uh, brother. Uh, Kirk Nevada, have you guys ever seen a DC sub in every defensive player like Holmes did? They couldn't even know when an adjustment was made. Yeah, I mean, I saw a lot of stuff happen in the Kerry Combs era, you know, his couple of years. Uh, we ran that 4-4 defense versus Bama, which was really, it's really, you know, I, I hate people beat tough Borland to death just because he did what he was assigned to do by his coordinator. You know, when, when he's like, you know, in man coverage versus Devontae Smith, he runs a 4-3-40, and tough, he runs like a five flat 40 and is a GA for Luke Fickle now. Um, is, is, is told to cover him man coverage. Like that's not Tuff's fault. That's the coordinator's fault. That's just an atrocious plan. You know, then against Oregon, we, you know, we were, we were in man coverage the whole game, Oregon, Joe Moorhead figured that out after the first quarter and they ran the same motion three times and magically, you know, they, we never adjusted and they ran the same play for like, it felt like 300, it was like 200 yards. It was crazy. And it was, it wasn't a hard adjustment. I mean, just switch to cover three, run some zone. You know, but we didn't. We ran man, and they sure as could be. They ran the same motion, and the corner went with them, and there's nobody home. But again, Kerry is a he's a guy I worked with, good guy. 
Um, but I was scared to death when they made him the DC because, you know, Urban demoted him uh, very publicly um, when when Chris Ash came. You made him special teams coordinator. You, you, Chris Ash wanted him to have nothing to do with the secondary coaching. And then, you know, he left and went with, with, with Rabel uh, to Tennessee. But, you know, like when Ryan hired him back to be a DC, I was like, I don't think Harry's ever called a defense before. You know, I mean, he might have at Cincinnati Colerain or somewhere younger in his coaching career, but he's never called a defense at a college level, and he wasn't calling a defense with the Tennessee Titans when he's a cornerbacks coach. So that's terrifying to me because again, it's like it's kind of like with Brian Hartline last year when people were like, oh, he's going to be, you know, could he be the play caller with Ryan? I'm like, Brian Hartline has never called a play in his life, and again, it's not his fault. You know, he came in as a analyst or whatever, and then he got promoted to be the the head receivers coach, which is great. Um, but you know, you really got to learn how to do that at like, uh, at like the Mac or like a smaller level before, you know, a guy like Ryan day is going to put his career in your hands and give you the sticks and let you call the plays. You know, Ryan's not going to do that. He'll do it with Chip Kelly because Chip's his mentor and he trusts Chip more than probably any coach in the world, but you're not going to get to be a first time play caller to high state because he learned his lesson from Kerry because Kerry was atrocious and he got, you know, he got fired after two years and we gave up six, six million points that year. And it was just painful to watch. Uh, Nevada, have you ever seen a DC sub every player like Kerry Combs did? Nah, just the disorganization was hard and it was palpable. You could just feel like they didn't really know what they're doing. And, and, and as you pointed out, like we called this the day he was named the DC. We're like Oof. this, this, this. So this isn't like, you know, revisionist history where we're like, oh yeah, Kerry Combs. And now we're like, oh, we're bagging on him. We said it at the time. We're like, he's never done this before. And no. this is a really kind of like I, I loved his enthusiasm i loved the way he loved ohio state i loved his recruiting and his cheers and but as a dc i had real questions we all had real questions and our worst fears kind of came out so um yeah I, I i we were concerned and i'm sorry that we were right on that one to be concerned because that was bad yeah and, and again that's why ryan went after mark d'antoni and will must mid-season because like i think after that oregon game he knew what he had and he's like I got to do anything I can to try to keep the water from, you know, again, we always use the Titanic analogy, but it's like he saw the water was already in the first two boiler rooms. And if it goes into room three and four, then there's no chance of saving the ship. Like the, the scene in the movie, the guy's like, it's in, there is no chance you have about an hour, sir, but there is no chance of saving the ship it is it will go down. Like that's, that's what it was like. And that's why he was desperate. I mean, like when he's reaching out to Will Muschamp and Mark D'Antonio, who's retired, like, he wants a big name, and he wants somebody that can run run the show. Beach Buck, thank you for the five. Natty in Georgia again, of course, like always. Uh, so we can play UG again as a home team. Uh, how was 07 playing LSU at home? How much of an impact versus a regular season game? It's a humongous advantage. Huge. Because you're literally playing in SEC territory. Everything about the place is SEC. It's their home field. You know, it'd be like if we played the national championship in like Canton or something like it's like an hour It's two hours from Columbus. It's you know, it's like an hour from Baton Rouge. So their fans, you know, can save a fortune because they don't have to fly down. They don't have to stay in a hotel so they can gobble up the tickets because they'd be like, well, we don't have to spend any money on travel. We just drive in the day of the game and in buses and, you know, get drunk and then go to the game and, you know, maybe party at Bourbon Street and then just go home. So it's a humongous advantage. And again, you know, like us having to play, you know, in the Georgia Dome is trash. Which again, I think Vegas would be a great venue for for a national championship, just because it's not a neutral site for anybody. Like playing in in Atlanta is that's that's a that's a victory for the Georgia Bulldogs. Now that Georgia's really good, um, I think it's it, it sucks and it really it angers me that like we don't have more. You know, obviously we were in Indy last year, but I I want more domes in the north so that they'll come up north because again they they want climate controlled. They don't want weather to be an issue. Um, obviously, you got to have the right facilities in terms of hotels and a uh, big enough airport to, to accommodate the fan base and all that. But, you know, I think it's it, it sucks that we always have to play in the South. You know, it's like the bowl gives you Orange Bowl, the Sugar Bowl, the Peach Bowl, um, the Cotton Bowl. They're all in the South. They're not in you – know, there's nothing in the North where these guys have to come. Now, last year they did. But in general, um, you know, I just think that it's, it's better – uh, or excuse me, uh, two years ago they did. Last year was in Los Angeles. I apologize uh, when, when Michigan won. But I, I I just think that you know having to come north would be so much better. 
Because again, it should be a true neutral site. Now I know that they, they pick these destinations way ahead of way in advance, but you know, it's it's just not, I don't think it's fair. Um and we played at LSU in 07. Again, they were better than we were. They had better players than we did. Um their quarterback played in the league for seven or eight, nine years. Our quarterback never played in the league. Um and the quarterback's the most important guy on the field, so there was a huge edge there. And again, I'm not blaming Todd. Like I love Todd Beckman, but you know, it is what it is. Um and, and I think that uh you know, playing LSU in Louisiana was just like one of those things where it would have been an, an incredible opportunity to have an incredible victory. But we just, you know, when you play stupid football like we did that night, five personal fouls, uh, you know, we, we don't block a punt. We tackle the punter on fourth and 23. Like we just, um, we drop a touchdown pass. We have a, a, a per, or we have a, a false start on the one yard line, which pushes us back. We have a field goal blocked. I mean, we just played so stupid. Like, honestly, we when I walked off the field, it's like, we didn't deserve to win that game. I was like, I mean, there's no, you have no chance when you play a good team with equal talent when you play that stupid of football. Um, Nevada, how big of an impact is it to have to play in Georgia versus Georgia again in the national championship, potentially? I just have one word for you. Wah! Wah! <laughs> Wah! Now, I... I like it's never going to change. It's always been that way. It's always going to be that way. And uh, it, it, I mean, at least they, they, I know the tickets don't exactly divvy out exactly even, but it's not like it's a true home game. Ohio state fans represent. Um, I remember at the, uh, when we played uh, Miami in that O2 national championship game, I mean, it felt like the stadium was like 85% Ohio state fans. I mean, it was so loud that Miami was having trouble calling Caden. So um uh, just go go win the game. Make your field goal at the end of the Georgia game two years ago and we're the national champion, and uh, we beat Georgia and Georgia. So, like you said, you guys played stupid in 07. You guys have those guys. Oh. If you don't – if you don't, oh. if you guys don't get that false start on it, from, and you know, you guys go up 14 nothing, and, and oh, uh, you, you darn well may win that game. Um, no. Because you mean, were in compl- – comp- Yeah. I, I, you know I, what I'm saying. Like, you know, football, it's a game of inches, man. And when you give up – when you play a team that's – probably physically better than you and you give them five personal fouls and you it was like florida like you know we our best player gets hurt then we go for it on our own 20 we don't make a backside cutoff we get stopped um we, we just played dumb you know so again it's not you know did we get slaughtered i mean it was 38 to 24 or whatever we got we actually outgained them on offense but we just gave them so many points and so many opportunities and again, you know, Robo drops the touchdown. And again, I love Brian Robisky. He's one of the greatest kids ever. Great hands, but we just drops the, drop the touchdown. It's right in his right in his hands. You know, so it's like when you do all that dumb stuff and it adds up versus a good team, you don't really have a chance. But yeah, I but I, I do wish every game was in Vegas though, because it'd be amazing. Um. Uh. Good night, Vo. Thank you for the five. Sorry, I got on late. So back to Michigan hockey this year. Last year, we have several of their ex players on the jackets. We do not have that timeline. We do not uh, know the players. Uh, we just know that that is something that is uh, not good for Michigan. Um, obviously, I know that they're uh, they, you know, we've drafted players, and there's a lot of really high picks from Michigan um, all across the NHL right now that are making big impacts. So I don't know if they're impacted, um, but we just again, this was a very broad overview of what was covered up by Ward Manuel. Um, so I'll just, I'll leave it at that. I wish, you know, I mean, as it comes out, obviously it'll, it'll come out if there are charges, just like the NHL thing did. Um, but that took a little bit of time. Uh, Artie Saunders, thank you for the 10, uh, with the increased number and cost of games, uh, many of which will involve travel. Will there be a breaking point with light crowds in stadiums in the postseason? That is a good question. Um, I don't know. I think playoff games get a little touchy sometimes because it is expensive. It's insanely expensive. And I think fans get fatigued by, you know, if you got to go to three playoff games on the road, do you want to hold out for the natty? Do you want to stay home? I think that's, that's a real question. Um, Nevada, your thoughts. Do you think with, with that many playoff games, like if Ohio State's good and they're in the playoffs every single year and you've got, say that every year we're a top four seed and we have a bye and then we have to play, you know, the the round of eight, the round of four, and then the championship. Will there get fatigue? Because again, these bowl games are extraordinarily expensive um, to fly to, travel to, hotel, whatever. Um, well, do you think that fatigue will be an issue and the crowds will get smaller? 
Well, I think it's definitely going to be an issue. I mean, look, I've done well, and my kids and I were talking about the whole schedule for this year, and we're like, hey, let's go to the Michigan game. Hey, let's go to the Big Ten championship game. Hey, let's go to playoff game one, and then we'll make reservations and go to flight of two, and then three. I mean, it's you got to understand, this is different than any sports ever done this before. Because basketball, Mm -hmm. they do it in the NCAAs, but you're talking about buildings that are 15,000 people, 18,000 people, or whatever it is. You're talking about, and in the NFL, you're talking about home games all the way up to the national championship. Now you're talking about neutral site games in 80,000 seat buildings, 90,000, 100,000 seat buildings on three consecutive weekends. And that's hard. Nobody's ever done it before. So I don't know if anybody can really say how it's going to go. I, I, you know, certainly in the beginning, you know, there's going to be a lot of novelty and, you know, won't be as big, you know, as impactful, but it's expensive. It's, do the math on what, what it's going to cost you to go to three or four playoff games in a row, plus a big 10 championship game. It's, it's like a small house in the Midwest. What's going to cost you if you're traveling with more than two people. So, um, I think it's a it's a great question because I'm not sure this has really been well thought out um, because this is something that's never been attempted before. Yeah, and, and like say like it's Ohio State and they they're the one seed and then they're playing, you know I I, I can't remember off the top of my head like what seed f- like funnels into that game. Um, you know, say they're playing like a lesser team, you know, and you're like, well, I just know that like the way our fan base works, they'll skip that first one um, and save their money for the final four or the natty. Cause like, you know, everybody wants to go to the national championship. Everyone will break the bank and, you know, we're going to go to the natty because, you know, we don't know when we're going to see another natty, which again is, is totally fine. But say like, so I'm just going to put this graphic up real quick to better illustrate it. Um, of course I accidentally switched my, my uh, iPad out. Let me get this back on. Um, but I, uh, so say like, you know, you, Ohio state is the three seed and Ole Miss upsets Georgia. Um, so say it's where Texas is. Imagine Ohio State's there. Like, if you see like a three versus eleven, like, are you going to take that game off and say, well, we should smoke them or twenty point favorites or whatever because we're dominant, whatever? Um, that's going to be the question. Or say like you're the the four seed and Liberty some for some reason, you know, Florida State has all these opt outs and Liberty wins. Like, do people want to go to a neutral site and watch Alabama play Liberty? Probably not. You know, and again, I'm, and again, that's kind of a a different one because Liberty is such an outlier of a team. Um, but yeah, like I just, I mean, we, we saw it this year with the Cotton Bowl. Like it wasn't a playoff game and our fans didn't really travel the way that they normally do because there's fatigue because it's so expensive. You drain your account to go to a bunch of these games and everybody wants to go to the Natty. Everybody wants to go to the playoff game. But, you know, that's that's the tough part. Like even when we played Georgia a few years ago, I had people saying, look, I love Ohio State, but, you know, I'm going to save my money for the Natty. Yeah, because you know, we get to the natty, like everybody wants to break the bank to go to that thing. Um, and they don't, it's not like they give you some sort of a credit and say, well, you went to the Georgia game, so you get read a first refusal for the tickets. So, um, again, I think that it's a, it's a great question and it's going to be really interesting to see uh, how that works. But again, that's why I love Vegas, you know, because Vegas is a city where people like, like the Browns play in Vegas this year, like that stadium will be all orange and brown because everybody wants to go there. And it's a place where if it's a destination city, I think it helps people go. Like if it's in Miami or Vegas or LA where there's like stuff to do, like I think people are more likely to go to that than if it's in Dallas. And Dallas is a great city, but like, you know, the the bowl game and there's not a lot of vibes in Dallas because the game's so far away from where most of the hotels are uh, with Jerry World, Um, Atlanta, I don't know. It's okay. Uh, But it's not the same as like, like the traditional like fun cities. So... All right, Nevada. Well, we can wrap this thing up. Uh, any final thoughts? No, just great, great show. If you uh, if you like the show, please leave us a like. Those likes are so helpful. They help you know it, it get recommended to other people that have similar interests. And so, if you want to give us a help, hit that little like, that little thumbs up there. Um, and appreciate you guys showing up. Um, the Michigan stuff is going to be interesting. I, 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 it, it's when it happens, remember where you heard it, the, but it's going to be a very interesting story, very interesting investigative reporting work. And, uh, I can't wait for it to drop. It'll be, it'll, that'll be a lot of fun. We'll, I'm sure we'll discuss it that night when it comes out as well. Yeah, it'll be, it'll be absolutely huge. 
Well, we appreciate you guys. Uh, Kim texted me about a merchandise drop that should be coming in the next two weeks or so. Uh, we're getting the final details ironed out. We're going to have a hoodie, a shirt, and a hat to start. Uh, it's kind of like a test drive. Um, it's going to be really fun to do. I'm really excited about it. Uh, so if you guys like the gear, it'll be black Nike gear. Um, real simple stuff. Uh, if you like it, again, eventually we'll add more styles and colors. This is kind of a test drive. Kind of see where the demand is. We have no idea. We haven't done a merch drop in a couple of years. Uh, but I think that you guys will really like it. It looks really sharp. I'm um, getting a couple of the blanks, so they'll be really cool. So that being said, if you guys enjoy this content on your way out the door, if you could leave us a like, hit that thumbs up. That's huge for us. Uh, again, if you uh, enjoy this channel, uh, please click subscribe. Send this to your friends, all of your favorite Buckeye supporters, all your favorite college football fans. Uh, tell them to subscribe. Again, we've had a ton of organic growth, so thank you for that. Uh, and if you guys really enjoy these live streams, I implore you to click on the little alert bell. You'll get an alert on your phone when you go live. I actually have an alternate YouTube account that gets the alert just to make sure that it works. Uh, so it popped up right when we went live. So you guys never miss a live show. So you guys can kick it with all of our awesome people in the chat. Shout out to Devin and Akeem. Appreciate you brothers both holding it down. Kim also is now holding the wrench. So the wrench trio is uh, keeping that chat nice and clean. Uh, nice and well moderated so you guys have a, a good, fun, family-friendly time. So with that being said, again, I appreciate you guys. Shout out where you guys are watching from. Shout out my Southern Ohio boys. Maybe we should do a meetup at the Sado River. Uh, the river, we are due for that. So if you guys are interested in Sado River, a lot of the guys on BuckeyeScoop.com meet me down there. We have a nice steak, and uh, I tell some more stories. It's always a good time. So I'd love to see my Southern Ohio boys down in Chesapeake, Galpolis, South Point, uh, all down there. My people, Port Portsmouth, uh, there are a ton of Buckeyes down there and I appreciate all of you guys. Thank you uh, to my Stark County people. Uh, again, I saw uh, Mr. Dickerhoof, um, the Louisville Leopard was in here. Really cool to see that. Uh, appreciate my support all through Ohio, Florida, Texas, Georgia, California, and all across the world. So shout out where you guys are watching from. Again, I read all the comments. I love seeing where you guys are watching from. That being said, thank you so much, Buckeye Nation. And thank you, Scoop family. We're going to talk to you guys tomorrow, 7 o'clock. We'll be ready to rock. Go Bucks.